Connect Church, PD here. Listen, I want to introduce to you one of my dear friends. He's made a major impact on my life. And I heard a quote years ago by a friend of my dad. His name is Charles Tremendous Jones. He said, you know, we'll be the same person today if not for the people we meet and the books we read. And this person has made a major, major impact on my life. Sean Lovejoy is going to be our guest today speaking to us at Connect Church. You know, there are certain people that come into your life and they're lid-lifting relationships because of their leadership. And so he's made a major influence on me, my wife, and our staff. And I want to share him with you today. Sean Lovejoy, he is a mega church pastor at one time. He turned now to coach marketplace leaders and coaches literally around the world. And he's here to influence you and to raise the bar in our church. And so I hope that you'll give him your full attention. Get your notebooks out. Get your Bibles out because we believe note takers are, come on, write it down, history makers. Get ready to receive the word. You're going to be blessed in a big way. Hey guys, Sean Lovejoy here. It's so great to be with you. It is my honor to be in your house and be your family. I feel like Connect Church is one of my secondary families. Uh, I bring you greetings from the South. You can probably already tell that from Birmingham, Alabama. I call Church of the Highlands home. And I coach marketplace and ministry leaders, but I'm honored to be a dear friend of your pastors, Pastor Derek and Stacy. And I love them. I like them. And just to give honor to them today, I want you to know, and maybe you're watching online for the first time, maybe you're visiting with us for the first time today, I just want you to know, one of the things I respect most about leaders is when they're the same behind stage as they are on stage. And I want you to know that's true for Pastors Derek and Stacy. They're just genuine, they're authentic, they, they love you, they talk about you often, they have dreams and burdens for you, and they care about the house. They care about the church and they love their staff. They love you. And Jesus said, they will know you're my disciples by your love. And um, they love you. They love you well. So you're not going to give them the big head by telling them that every once in a while. Drop them a note. Say hello. Hug their necks when you see them in person. Let them know how God has used them um, in your life. Um, I'm excited to sort of give your pastor a break today and teach on their behalf and um, just pour into your life. I just want to encourage you. I prayed for you this morning. I pray over my calendar. It keeps me from being narcissistic in my prayers. And um, I prayed for you that God would use me in your life today to encourage you. And I'm going to talk about what that looks like for you um, later on today. I've been married for 28 years. I'm very proud of that. I made it through lots of grace and mercy and licensed professional Christian counseling. We're here today and we're partners and we're best friends. My wife, Tricia, and uh, she's the CFO of Courage to Lead. Uh, she's frugal. I'm generous. It makes a great marriage. And um, it, we, 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 we have three beautiful children. My daughter, Hannah, got married last year. And um, they're pregnant, so I'm going to be a papa in November. <laughs> and then I have a recent graduate from high school who's attending Auburn University in the fall. And then my son will be a junior in high school. He'll be 17. And um, he may be the smartest one and has the softer heart than the girls, but don't tell them I said that. Uh, in the meantime, I want to talk to you today and encourage you on the heels of this pandemic. Uh, raise your hand if you've lived through a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. We, we, if you're watching this message and you're participating in this, like you've lived through some of the darkest days in our world's history and lived to tell about it. And a lot of us know someone. Maybe we've lost a loved one. Maybe we know someone that's been lost. And our lives have been plagued, you know, by fear and anxiety in the last 18 to 24 months. It's been crazy. And COVID has indeed proven itself to be a formidable foe, dangerous, contagious. But can I tell you, there are some other things that have reared their ugly heads in terms of their ability to affect negatively other people's lives, their contagion factor, and their danger. Things like fear, anxiety, disunity, negativity, depression, uh, Counselors are telling us that suicide is at an all-time rate. Depression medication is flying off the pharmacy shelves. It's dark out there, and a lot of people are discouraged. A lot of people are looking for hope. But I believe that gives the church of Jesus Christ an opportunity. 
because the darker it is, the brighter the light shines. So what I want to talk about today is how you and I, as Christ followers, can be greater salt and light in these days in which we're living. I want to talk about how to be more positively contagious. More positively contagious. Who's interested in that? Okay, two of you. I'm hoping more of you catch on. I'm inviting you today to join a new movement. I'm launching. Let's just launch it today. The positively contagious movement. And I'm going to ask you to join uh, at the conclusion of my talk. So hope you'll take some notes on your phone, your iPad, your notebook, whatever, your journal. Because if God speaks to you, you might want to write it down. I want to talk about this. I really do believe one of the essences of Jesus' life is that he was positively contagious. He had this magnetic factor. The children loved, loved running up to him. He had an approachability to him. And people were attracted to his message. When Jesus comes on the scene 2,000 years ago, think about it. He, he begins preaching and teaching right away. But what's interesting to me is that Jesus' first sermons really aren't some deep new theological truths that have never been heard before, like we think should characterize great preaching. When he comes on the, on the scene, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Well, honestly, that wasn't an entirely new message. Uh, J Isaiah and Jeremiah had preached a lot on repentance and the kingdom coming hundreds of years before. And frankly, the Pharisees had been teaching those messages as written in the prophets. And then they're leaning up on the edge of their chairs. Jesus, what's the most important command? What does Jesus say? Love God. Love people. Simple message. And it wasn't new. Moses had preached that message back in Deuteronomy. And yet scripture tells us that thousands of people are leaving the teachings of the Pharisees and flocking to Jesus' sermons. Frankly, a dynamic I see happening 2,000 years later in churches. People leaving the teachings, thorough doctrine, in this church and flocking to this church. Why? Jesus tells us what the attractive magnetic factor was in the Gospels through the eyes and lenses of the apostles over and over and over again. And I'm going to reveal that to you today. Turn with me in your Bibles. Look on your smart devices. Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. It says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he had been teaching about the importance of applying the gospel to our lives and building our house on a rock. It says, when he finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he thoroughly explained the Hebrew language. It actually doesn't say that. It says, because he taught as one who had authority. Now catch this, not as their teachers of the law. Crazy enough, the Pharisees were the ones who had recognized authority in society. They were recognized by the government. They were recognized by the religious order of their day as having authority. Jesus had no other recognized authority. And then yet they're saying, this man, when he teaches, speaks with a sense of authority, more so than the teachers of the law. In other words, there was something about the way Jesus proclaimed the gospel. There was something about the way he conveyed the Christian message that made him different. There was something about his body language. There was something in the tone of his voice. There was a look in his eye. And they were thinking to themselves, he might be crazy, but he really believes what he's telling us. And then when he steps down from the sermon, the way he lived his life, the moral authority in which he let, lived his life, there was, there was a consistency, just like I told you earlier with Pastors Derek and Stacy. He, he, he lived out the message that he proclaimed with his mouth. And thousands of people began to leave the dead, stale teachings of the same message of the Pharisees and flocked to Jesus' message. In other words, passion was one of the words that characterized Jesus' life. When, when he taught, when he lived, there was a sense of conviction in which he lived his life. There was a sense of urgency and energy and enthusiasm. And people were compelled not so much by what he said, but how he said it and how he lived it. 
And I really do believe therein lies a real problem in Christianity today. Ironically, I meet so many Christians who lack passion in their lives. They lack that sense of energy. They lack that sense of enthusiasm. It's the reason why I believe most churches aren't growing. Honestly, I don't run across that many churches that are preaching heretical messages. They're, thir they're thorough in their doctrine. I get a chance to, to write and speak, and I, I, I teach in lots of churches on Sundays during the week. Um, I, we, we also have a marketplace coaching division at Curtis Delia. We work with shepherds on Sundays and their churches and consulting coach with them. But we're consulting and coaching with lots of shepherds between Sundays in the marketplace. And I walk in and I'm teaching in these environments and, you know, they're looking at me. They're sizing me up, but they don't know. Let me let you in on a secret for the communicator and a preacher and a teacher and a consultant. We're sizing you up as well. We're picking up on little things that we see. Vibes, energy, enthusiasm, apathy, body language, passive aggressiveness, all of those things in the room. And so I'm up teaching a lot of churches, to be honest with you. And I look out over the room and here's the secret. I see dead people. <laughs> I see the walking dead spiritual zombies that are going through the motions. When my goodness, of all things in God's house... It ought to be a celebration. It ought to be a party. We ought to be celebrating the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done in our lives. But not just on Sundays, between Sundays. There ought to be a difference about the way we live our lives because Jesus lives in us. And it ought to be noticeable by, other, by others. That's how you become positively contagious. When Jesus comes on the scene, he tells everybody why he's come. And it's not just to save us from hell. That's a narrow definition of the gospel. He says in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Our passion, by the way, as much as anything else. Our joy, our enthusiasm, our impact. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And he wasn't talking about life, eternal life, way out there somewhere when we die. He's talking about now. He said, the kingdom of heaven is near. It's close. You can have it. Today, in these 1,440 minutes God's given us today, your life can overflow and impact the lives of other people. That's why Jesus came. So we've got to hold ourselves accountable to that. So the question we need to be asking ourselves when it comes to being positively contagious is this. If I was the only exposure to Jesus someone had, would they want to catch what I have? If I was the only exposure to Jesus that people had, would they want to catch what I have? Who's interested in having that kind of impact on other people? I know I am. I know I want to do a better job in these days of being positively contagious in our culture. So I'm going to give you three ways. Hopefully you'll write them down, type them in somewhere you can become a more positively contagious person. And we see these in the glory of God with the reflection of Jesus Christ and his life and the way he lived and preached his message. Number one, how to be more positively contagious. Be more positive. Be more positive. Hey, our world is filled with bad news. Is it not? It's filled with bad news. You don't have to look to find bad news in our world. Jesus knew that 2,000 years ago. The Pharisees were putting an unnecessary burden on people. They had added all of these laws, 613 laws to the original Ten Commandments that Moses had given people. They were oppressing people. They were preaching on sin, and that was the end of it. <laughs> sin and repentance, not a fun message, unless it's connected to the good news. When Jesus comes along, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, this is early on in Jesus' ministry. After John was put in prison, after John the Baptist was arrested, it says Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. When Jesus comes preaching, what is the core of his message? It's good news. See, the Pharisees had been talking about all the rules and all the way you could break the rules and everything they were against. Jesus was focused on what he was for. 2,000 years later, oh, that the church would rally around more what we're for than what we're against. 
I'm telling you, if we could live that way and be enthusiastic and passionate about the good news rather than focusing on what we and who we got to take a stand against, the church might fill up with people around the world. So I'm challenging us in, in that way. John chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus said, I've told you all of this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete, complete. So as followers of Jesus, one of the defining characteristics of our lives we should hold ourselves accountable to is joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit, not a fruit of our circumstance. And so if the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, our lives should be characterized by an enthusiasm, a passion, a, a, a joy in our lives. Let's be honest, aren't there just some people that you know, they're, they're, you, you hope they're going to heaven, but you just hope their mansion's not close to yours for all of eternity? <laughs> Let's be honest, don't be pious with me. It's, it's that guy, it's that gal. You see them in Walmart on aisle 12 before they see you? Yeah, and what do you do? You duck in the produce aisle, right, and you hide. What, what do those people typically have in common? that suck the life out of you. They're self-absorbed, negative people. And they want to talk about all the bad things that are happening to them and happening in this world, and they literally suck the life after you. They're energy vampires. I don't want you to be an energy vampire. And if you can't think of that person right now, you might be that person. And I don't want you to be that person. I want you to be a proclaimer of good news listen if it's not noble if it's not excellent if it's not praiseworthy if it's not admirable about a person don't say it don't say it dwelling on it is bad enough but giving lips to it actually affects other people in a negative way so we don't need to talk about and multiply all this negative stuff on Facebook I'm meddling now aren't I we don't have to, to multiply and share the good the bad news we need to be focused on good news as people of God. I'm telling you, the body of Christ would be more attractive, more magnetic. Our faith would be more positively contagious if we would be more positive. So one of the questions I need to ask myself is, is my attitude and conversation characterized by good news? In our coaching at Courage to Lead in the marketplace as well as the ministry, we talk about the gears of growth. What is it that, what are the irreducible minimums that make up a, a growing organization that aids momentum or if it doesn't exist, kills momentum? And we talk about culture, we talk about team, and we talk about systems. I can trace every opportunity for momentum in an organization, ministry or marketplace, back to those three things. And also every opportunity for growth out there. But when it comes to the culture we're trying to build in a church, in a company, on a team, we have to be the culture we want to build. So if we want it to be a fun place to work, guess what? Guess what? We have to be a fun person. <laughs> so ask your spouse, ask your partner, ask your best friend, am I a fun person? And to be honest with you, I have to work at that. I'm an eight on the Enneagram. I'm a challenger, they call it. I am intense, I'm hard hitting, I'm always about taking the next hill and I can, I can come across as uh, too intense and, and intimidating. I've, I've been told early on in my career that I was an intimidating person and I'm like, what, what's up? And I've got to realize I've got to bring some fun to the room. I've got to bring some life. I've got to bring some joy. I've got to bring some good news. I've got to celebrate our progress and not focus on perfection. So you've got to do that in your life. Number two, the second way you can be more positively con contagious, be encouraging. Be more encouraging. Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, said no one ever died from too much encouragement. Think about that. No one ever died. What's interesting is in Scripture, God has this pattern of, of recognizing potential greatness in someone, calling it out publicly in them. He goes to Abram and he renames him Abraham, the father of many nations. He didn't even have children yet. He goes to Jacob, which means deceiver, and he says, you're going to be Israel, chosen one, chosen people. 
Jesus comes along. What does he do? He takes Simon, the fisherman, and the coward who's denied him three times. And he says, you're Petrus, Peter, which means rock. He hadn't really talked about his faith at all since he had denied Jesus. He comes along, knocks Saul off of his donkey, the persecutor of Christians. He said, you're going to be Paul. Great, me- you're going to be my messenger, my chosen instrument to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He hadn't shared the gospel with anybody yet. So in our lives, if we want to walk like Jesus, be like Jesus, you know what we need to do? We need to recognize potential in someone before they see it in themselves and call it out in them and call it out publicly. Because if we can see that seed and potential in them, we're actually going to help them elevate. People normally become and rise to the level we tell them they can. And so we need to be messengers of encouragement. Why, why, why does the church exist? Why does the church exist? Um, if you think about it, we can sing songs in the shower. I sound better in the shower. I, I do. Anybody else? I can watch messages online. And thank God we've had that opportunity. And if you're watching this message online and you have fear and you, you want to keep your family safe, we understand that. I'm telling you, but there is no substitute for being in God's house. And here's why. We need each other. I'm convinced Jesus created the church, maybe primarily because as followers of Jesus, we need each other. What do we need from each other? Look at this, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. He says, let us consider, let's work on this, let's strategize around this, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together. You hear that? as some are in the habit of doing in 2021, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, why do we gather together in the church? Not just on Sundays, but in the new small groups that we're launching on Mondays and Tuesday nights and other nights during the week. Why do we gather together in biblical community in the church? To spur one another on toward love and good deeds, to encourage each other, to hold each other accountable, to to see someone's potential and call it out in them, believe the best about them, to pray over them, tell them we believe in them, we've got their back, and and we're going to protect each other now and forever. That's what the church is all about. I pray over my calendar on a daily basis. That's why I prayed for you guys today. It keeps me from being narcissistic in my prayers to just pray over each day and commit the, my, my, my meetings you know, to, 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 to the Lord. And one of the questions I ask myself that I think every follower of Jesus should ask ourselves every day is, who can I encourage today? And how can I encourage them? Repeat after me. <laughs> Who, who can I encourage today and how can I be an encourager? If you will walk into the marketplace and you'll be an encourager and not worry about how it's received, but just recognize the potential in people, recognize the positive traits of people and call them out and, 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 and publicly in front of people, I'm telling you, man, you'll, you'll have to turn friends away. <laughs> you'll have so many. You'll be positively contagious. Number three, last one. You can be positively contagious by being more zealous, more zealous. Now, zeal and being zealous is not something we talk about a lot in today's society, but everyone has zeal. We all have zeal. We all have passion about something. Um, I'm a huge college football fan, grew up in the South, University of Alabama football fan. I cried when Paul Bear Bryant died. Some of you don't even know who he is, but I'm passionate about that. And I care about that. And um, you want to get me talking about something? Start talking about college football. I just love the sport. We're all, we're all zealous. Some of us are zealous about our work, zealous about golf, zealous about shopping. We're zealous about something. But I really believe Christ followers, we ought to be zealous about God, zealous about his house, zealous about the gospel, zealous about the good news. And passion is not always this glib kind of artificial, you know, fake, hyped up joy I I can't relate to people you know you know those people that are Christians you shake their hand and they're like how are you doing I'm great how are you doing well bless God I'm so great I can't stand myself like I really can't relate to that kind of person Uh, um, I don't understand that 
And I don't think that comes across as genuine and sincere. In fact, we don't, we don't see that in Jesus' life. I really think Jesus could have been an introvert. And sometimes his passion showed up more like holy anger than flat enthusiasm or hyped up energy. Look at this, John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. He says, so he made a whip out of cords. Some of you know the situation. People had sort of turned God's house into a marketplace and had started making money off people by selling uh, animals for sacrifice and communion elements and the sort. And they were trying to make a profit off God's people to be faithful to him. And Jesus did not like it. It says he drove all the people from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers, overturned their tables to those who sold doves. He said, get out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And his disciples remembered that it's written, and it's a direct quote from Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus says, listen, if you want to get me fired up, if you want to make me holy anger, if, if you want, I will stand up for God and I will stand up for his house and his mission and his purpose remaining pure. Don't get me started. <laughs> That's the way Jesus said. Interestingly enough, he was quoting King David who said, I can't wait to go to God's house and worship. Zeal to be in God's house consumes me. Let me ask you a question. When you got ready to worship today, you got ready to come to church or watch church. Did you say, I can't wait to worship God. I can't wait to serve God. I can't wait to give to God. Or were you apathetically going through the religious motions? I know that's not who you want to be. It's not who I want to be. I want you to have zeal. I want you to have passion in your life. Zeal for God's house. So how committed are you to the things of God? And would other people notice that? My family will tell you I'm a very competitive person. And they sort of take their cues from me. My kids are all like me, highly competitive. Like our family can't sit down and play the board game Monopoly together. It gets crazy, all right? I made my teenage son uh, cry and run to the bathroom the last time we played Monopoly. So we can't play it anymore. True story. We are competitive, I can't just have a well-manicured lawn. I got to have the best lawn. I can't just have Christmas lights. I got to have the most Christmas lights, all right? I timed myself mowing my yard, set a record last week, 37 minutes. You top that, all right? That's me. I want to win. I want to win at everything I do. I want to be the best at everything I do. And I have to channel that. I have to make sure the zeal is directed in the right direction, and you should as well. What are you passionate about? What are you zealous about? I don't know about you, but I want to be more zealous about following Jesus, about representing Jesus. I want to have more zeal and passion for worshiping God and serving God and giving to God over and over and over. In Romans chapter 12, verse 11 says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. That word lacking can also mean slothful. Slothful. We get that word from the animal called the sloth. Have you ever observed a sloth moving around? Make sure you have some time on your hands. If you're going to watch them go from point A to point B, they just move around slowly. But you know what? I watch the way some Christians work between Sundays. And guess what? They're just moving around. I watch some Christians Walk into churches. They're just moving around. There's no energy. There's an apathy. There's a lack of enthusiasm. There's a lack of joy. There's a lack of anticipation for what God is about to do in them and through them. And I am challenge you and you as a Christ follower today. Man, show up with enthusiasm. Show up with energy. Show up with passion. Make people at work ask themselves privately, man, what makes him tick? He's so full of joy. He's so full of energy. He outworks all of us and he never seems depleted. So much so that eventually they walk up to you and say, man, I just got to know. I've wondered, I've watched you. What makes you tick? Where does the energy come from? Where does the enthusiasm come from? Where does the work ethic come from? You outwork us all and it's like you're never tired. And you're able to say, you know what? I'm on a mission. 
I'm living my life of eternity. I believe Jesus is coming back soon. And I, I have 1,440 minutes today, and I believe it's a stewardship principle. I want to I wanna maximize my 1,400 minutes today for the glory of God. I want to f- reflect the nature of Jesus, and I want other people to ask me what makes me tick just like you did today. And can I tell you about a great church where I learned all this Connect Church? Man, I'd love for you to come with me and see what God's doing this Sunday. Can you imagine having that kind of impact? It's available to you. The same Spirit of God that rested and hovered on Jesus, lived in and through him, can live in and through you. Today, would you be willing to say to you, I've lost my first love, I've lost my passion, I've lost my zeal, I've lost my positivity during this pandemic. I've not been an encourager. I've become become to focus inward. The best way to get out of a depression cycle is take the focus off yourself and start dying to yourself and serving other people. What does that look like for you? At home, at work, at church, to be more positively contagious by bringing more passion, more energy to the room. Anybody can be a thermometer and reflect the temperature in the room. What I'm challenging you to do is to become a thermostat. Set the energy in the room. And if you'll do that, if you'll bring more passion, not in a fake, trumped up, hyped up kind of way, in an authentic way that comes by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, you'll have the most impactful year of your life. And this church could as well. And that's what I'm praying for you guys. Maybe you've never opened your life up to Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, forgiver and leader. I'd love to give you that opportunity today because you need to know you can't have the passion of Christ if you don't have Christ living inside of you and his spirit dwelling inside of you. As Christians, we don't just believe in God. We believe God can live inside of us. That's the essence of the good news and change us from the inside out. And I want that for you. You would just pray a prayer like, Lord Jesus, I do believe you're God's son. I believe you have authority, ability, capacity to save me from my sins. Come into my life and be my savior, my forgiver, my Lord, my leader. And if you're willing to pray a prayer somewhere along those lines that reflects the desire of your heart, then you just move from death to life spiritually, the Bible says. And Christ lives in you. And we're going to be together for all eternity. And he has forgiven you for every law and rule you've ever broken and every law and rule you will break. And that, my friend, is good news. And it gives you a cause to celebrate and be filled with passion in your life. If you made that decision today, text CC Saved, they tell me, to 97,000. CC Saved to 97,000. And the church would love to send you a new book by Pastor Chris Hodges, Church of the Highlands, that um, is called What's Next. It just tells you how to take your next spiritual step. But for all of us, our next conversation, probably to some at work, at home, at church, that know us well, that have observed us lately, say, hey guys, I'm sorry. I owe you an apology. After we've had this conversation with God, I've, not, I've lost my passion lately. But I've been convicted by it. God's reminded me of what he's done in me and through me. And um, I want things to be different around here. I want it to be more positive. I want it to be more encouraging. I want it to be filled with more enthusiasm and energy. And I, as the leader, want to bring that more to this family, to this team at work, to this church, to the dream team to the small group, whatever it looks like for you. And if we'll do that together, we'll just, you and I, together, launch the Positively Contagious Movement. Are you with me? Let's pray together. God, I offer these men and women to you today, and I pray, Lord, you will fill them with your passion in an authentic way. May they be energized by the good news of Jesus Christ today and it shows up at lunch, at home, at work tomorrow and in this church day in and day out, in their small group, on the dream team, everywhere they go, Lord. Lord, usher in the positively contagious movement and make this world different because we've lived in it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for allowing me to share with you.